It's Friday night. I'm on my third Bumble date of the week, and I am two tequila sodas into no longering if Jake in FinTech thinks I'm smart. He doesn't. <laughs> he thinks I am pretty, and so that is who I will become. He explains cryptocurrency to me. And I nod at all of the appropriate times, pretending that this isn't the definition of deja vu. We order another round. The room is packed with young, beautiful bodies, and the music competes with Jake's stories. But he knows he has my full attention. I wait for my turn to speak, my giggles book ending anything he has to say, as if he is the most interesting man in the world. I make up a little game with myself, counting the songs that pass until he asks me a question. I try and smile with my lips closed, concealing the gap between my teeth. I excuse myself to the bathroom for the opportunity to check my phone, assess the slow decline of my life, and reapply my <laughs> lipstick. Each step towards the mirror feels a little too shaky for comfort. The line for the bathroom stretches endlessly through the hallway. Girls teetering atop heels surrounded by friends. Electric possibility hangs in the air. I stare devotedly down into my phone, scrolling through a sea of thin, blonde desirables, waiting my turn to peer into the mirror and see how I will never stack up. The smudgy bar mirror reflects back the image of all the women that came before me. We have a family nose. Its gentle slope travels in time adorning the faces of my maternal lineage. It's delicate, a feature that doesn't draw attention to itself cute as a button just like any respectable woman should be. I reach for my bag, pulling out a glossy pink to paint across my lips, understated. My mother was and is especially beautiful. I see so much of her and the woman looking back at me, her full lips that gently parted to reveal all the ways I wasn't a good enough daughter, all the ways in which I was too loud, too big, too much. The soft feminine features that blur into the background so that men can always stand in the spotlight. I press my lips together, transferring the shine from top to bottom, using my pinky finger to wipe away any excess from the corners. I note the little chips in my nail polish, hoping they don't reveal too much about me. My mother taught me to always put sunscreen on your hands. She said it was the first thing that would announce your age to the world. I think about her long, slender fingers and the priceless rock that announced she mattered, that she had won her place in a loveless marriage. My sister was the smart one, talented, her little hands barely stretched across the octaves of her piano. Our family nose was centered on her face, but her blue eyes had a sparkle to them, the glimmer of shiny trophies, the reflections of cracked open college acceptance seals, and the depths of everything she could be. They told her she could become anything she wanted, anything she put her mind to. She was different, but my mother and I were the same. The highest honor achievable for women like us is earning love. My only chance at acceptance was just a right swipe away. <laughs> this week, I will turn 24. My mother was 21 when she brought me into the world. They say I have plenty of time, but the only thing she taught me to value is rapidly decaying. I reach my hand up towards my forehead to smooth out the space between my brows, anticipating the wrinkles that will begin to form there. My mom's cool eyes rest just underneath, a misunderstood longing welling up inside of them. I can see sadness escaping from the corners of her closed mouth smile. I wonder who first told her that she was too much. I wonder if the mirror she holds back reflects the image of me. I began to run my hands through the unruly waves that brushed against my shoulders, wearing it the longest I had been since I was a teenager. My mom would be so happy that I finally started to grow it out. My blonde hair came from my father's side, and my mother continuously dyed hers to match. My sister and I grew up hearing that God intended for a woman's hair to be her crowning glory. Every Sunday morning before church, we'd sit together in front of my mother's mirror. She'd wield her bright red hairbrush, comb through a nest of tangles, and transform her wild child's golden locks into a crown. The stubborn knots would be swept away, and she taught me with a bow, fixing me into the daughter that she wanted. 
Over time, the bows were replaced with shouting matches where my mother's voice rivaled mine. Sunday mornings were replaced with Saturday nights, and I began to master the sneaky tilt of my phone when messages from men danced across the screen. As a teenager, unmonitored internet access and a desperate desire to be loved brought me to places where respectable girls should never go. I began developing the formula for what made people, mostly men, like me. I'd pull on a little dress and the heavy-handed sexuality of an adolescent learning what it's like to be wanted for the first time. I armed myself with an ID stolen from my sister that said I was definitely over 21 and practiced not having an opinion on anything. I thought I'd finally found what I'd been searching for. He was tall, and he liked all of my pictures on Instagram. I lied to my parents about late night choir practices and slipped off into his downtown apartment. The pile of records and Ikea bookshelves with literature felt fancy to 16-year-old me. I'd stand shaky in front of him, peeling off my outer, outer layers, giving him everything he asked for. But he kept asking for more and more and more, and when I'd run out of things to give, he began to take. My mother taught me that love was something to be earned. Through her life, she collected bouquets of purple fingerprints from lovers and tucked memories of ignored no's into our shared history. A trembling, nervous system was woven just as deeply into our family legacy as our button nose. In those days, I felt a crackle of fire inside of me. I didn't know what I wanted to be, but I didn't want to be pretty anymore. My eyes didn't have the sparkle of my sisters, but they had embers that burnt with fury. It wasn't fucking fair. These things that made us valuable made us so vulnerable. Lit by the glow of my cracked iPhone screen and the YouTube video, how to DIY a pixie cut. I sat on the floor of my childhood bedroom and sheared away any hope of winning my mother's approval. My crowning glory in my mother's eyes, and maybe God's too, fell to the floor in thick blonde clumps. When I told my mother what I had done, I couldn't make my eyes meet hers. So my gaze stayed glued to the faded carpet and the evidence I had left behind. She cried although I can never be sure exactly who her tears were for. My mother was beautiful, but I needed her to be so much more. We never spoke about it again. The only reminders were the awkward growing out stages of a bad haircut and the extended silence. There were no more shouting matches. Time softened anger into acceptance and my impossible dreams of being someone different than her faded. I reached my hands out to steady myself against the sink. The porcelain feels cool against my skin, cool enough to extinguish the last of the dwindling flames in my belly. The fluorescent lights in the bathroom start to feel harsh, the loneliness that snakes its way through the roots of my family tree fully illuminated. I want to love the woman in front of me, but I don't know how. So I return to my date. We talk about his life, his childhood, the podcast he's going to start producing. <laughs> But he is no longer a real person to me, just somewhere to store my insecurities for a little while. Jake reaches across the table and brushes his fingers through my hair and finally asks me a question. Do you want to get out of here? I nod my head yes. At the BAMP stage for the first time, that's Brennan Smith, everybody.